Pokrima Media's Polity um, Tabi Shomulikai, South African politician, former guerrilla and military commander Ronnie Kasrols joins me to discuss his co-authored book with Fidelis Hove titled Comrade and Commander, The Life and Times of Joe Mudise. Comrade and Commander, The Life and Times of Joe Mudise captures the story and contribution of Joe Mudise, who rose from being a bus driver in Sophia Town in the late 1940s to being a freedom fighter and to also being Democratic South Africa's first Minister of Defense in Nelson Mandela's cabinet in 1994. So Uncle Ronnie, how did you and Fidelis Hove go about compiling this book about Joe Mudise, who also happens to be Fidelis's father-in-law? Yes, exactly. So Fidelis, who comes from Zimbabwe, had married Joe Mudisi and Jackie Sidibe, the retired general, their daughter, Oipuso. And over quite a period of time, they felt that he wasn't being given a fair deal in the media and the public. In fact, you know, there were constant smears about Joe Mudisi. And they were really, I would say, quite heartbroken and distress is a better word. So they felt that there was a need to bring out a book. And the starting point was Fidelis with one of the ANC or MK veterans uh, began to do a series of interviews. They just felt they would start by compiling interviews. He had very good connection with the former Zebra veterans in Zimbabwe. That's the military wing of ZAPU. And they collected quite a number of very interesting interviews and views of the esteem in which the Zimbabwean comrades had Joe Mudisi. They had worked together with him, notably in the 1960s, and he helped to revive the problems they were going through and the um, fact that the struggle there and the armed struggle was in the doldrums. And in effect, he virtually was regarded by them as their commander. He did incredible things. This greatly encouraged Fidelis. They then began interviews with various MK and ANC veterans. And then they came to me, somebody who knew Joe Mudisi from the beginning of MK Mkontawisizwe and the armed struggle, right through the whole period from the early 60s to the point where he became Minister of Defence. I was his deputy and a close friend of the family until his passing. In the interview, because I was able to span the whole period of his adult life, they then had a discussion as a family and they asked me to take over the project and to write a biography. I had read the transcripts of the first dozen or so interviews and was very impressed. So my view was continue with these interviews, we'll bring in the former adversary of our struggle, the former South African Defence Force, people who had transformed, who were part of his ministry as Defence Minister and uh, the Armed Forces. So that was a tremendous add-on to give the views of both comrades, family, friends, former ministers, and uh, former enemy, if we can use that term these days, certainly the adversary. And that was continued. I became part of the interviewing team, and we must have gone through at least 100 interviews. In the end, we've used almost 50 very abridged interviews to make the book. Obviously, you know, you do verbal interviews and you get hours and hours, so there's considerable work 
in concentrating it down without losing the gist of, of the subject and the times that Mudisi lived through. We made up a very good team and we became the co-editors of Comrade and Commander. And why do you think the story of Joe Mudisa has not been spoken of widely? Well, th- that's a very important and relevant point. In one sense, one can blame ourselves in the liberation movement and government because he was a formidable figure, the commander of MK for most of the 30 years in exile, taking over from the Mandela generation who were all locked up or had been executed. And there has been writings, autobiographies and then biographies. So there was, unfortunately, the fact that he was overlooked I feel very guilty that I didn't do more earlier on, but I had been writing over that period of time articles about him and how important he was. I just hadn't the time that was needed to do something like a full-fledged biography. The other aspect really is not so much that he was overlooked, but he was projected as a key liability, a person who was regarded by some who were anti the ANC and the liberation struggle and anti-MK, who produced books and interviews in which they were constantly projecting the liberation forces and its personalities as having been corrupted people and to blame for the corruption in South Africa today, long after Mutisi's death. And he had, therefore, this very, very negative media and viewpoint. So the two angles of a tendency of, of neglecting all our heroes and then of not fully defending them, I think I was probably in terms of interaction with the media, I would say I was the sole voice of writing up the positive aspects and achievements of Joe Modisi. And that's what the book aims to put right and to deal with the achievements above all as the primary aspect, but in the process as well, to deal with the smears and show how false they are. And also talking about how false the allegations are, what evidence have you presented in the book that challenges the allegations of corruption against Mudise? Well, it's not only, by the way, about so-called corruption under the, what people call incorrectly, the arms deal. You know, it was arms procurement program for the South African National Defence Force, our new defence force. It was a tax on him as something of a thug, given the fact that he came from, and they were mistaken, because some family members were from Alexander Township, not the only township that had some legacy or or notoriety of gangsterism. But they seized on this. And because he was a tough guy, something of a street fighter in the best sense. I'm talking about politically defending the ANC, defending Mandela and the program from the late 1940s when he became a member of the Youth League under Mandela. The South African regime and its disinformation program cost the ANC leaders and then MK leaders in the most negative light as thugs, as criminals, and as people who lived in the lap of luxury in exile and sent people to their deaths without dirtying their own hands, without going into the battlefield themselves. So it was a whole range of of such allegations that, that he was a bully to the troops and so on. So these aspects came through from very early times from the regime attempting to smear the leadership of the ANC and MK and taken up by anti-communist smear tactics 
in the literature, and that literature during the struggle tended to be dominated because we didn't write about ourselves and we couldn't reveal so much of this the need for secrecy and the clandestine aspects of, of, of what we were doing. And therefore, those who opposed us in this vehement way, smearing the ANC as tools and pawns of Moscow and such like, you know, the Cold War anti-communism, the finger of terrorism pointed at us. They produced books and they used deserters from MK who had their axes to grind, who had been indisciplined and therefore had faced some tongue lashings from people like Medici or were suspended from higher office. So there, there were people who had those axes to grind, who people like Stephen Ellis, who was the key author of a couple of books using these traitors, basically, who exaggerated and uh, smeared Mudisi amongst others. That the way we were able to dispel it was very easy in terms of the methodology we used, because instead of Fidelis and myself, in a subjective sense, people could say, well, Fidelis as a family member is going to whitewash Mudisi, and Ronnie Casrells, who was his close friend and who served with him in high office during MK's period, in the period before 1990, and then as his defence minister, would also whitewash him. But we chose extremely credible people from within MK and in the former defence force who would give the correct story and counter the falsification that I've referred to. So let's give one simple example of, of how easy it was to dispel the myth that he was something of a thug. He belonged to a gang called the Vimsorby Gang in Alexander Township. Uh, through people who worked with him in the 40s, and into the 50s, who were able to say, well, to start off with, he wasn't from Alexander Township. He was from Sophia Town. He didn't belong to a gang. He was streetwise like any urbanized young African person of the time. Uh, if he wore fancy clothes, there was a reason to this. A, that he was a bus driver, so he earned an honest living. And secondly, that particular group, like young people today of the urban environment, take on the particular positive identification and projection of pride. And in those days, to wear not the most expensive clothing, but something which was rather nifty on the weekends, was to say to the police, we are people who earn a living. We buy clothing because we take pride in ourselves and we dress better than you do when you're in civilian clothing. We don't depend on the liberal whites handing down used clothing to us. Secondly, like young people's jargon today, culturally, in those days, this is when urbanized young blacks began speaking a pidgin language, which was unfairly referred to as Tsotsital, which, of course, young streetwise gangsters loved to use, this amalgam of slang and Afrikaans uh, mixed with Zulu and so on, pidgin language. Uh, but it wasn't only them. These young, honest people making an honest living, together with the projection, making a statement through their clothing, they were making a statement as well. We don't simply use English or simply Afrikaans. We have our own mix.
and uh, we take pride in that. So, you know, there are these people from that time until even now who love to talk a bit of so-called totita. It was the conservative elements in township society who were a little bit taken aback like older people being conservative even today by the jargon and the projection of a somewhat upstart arrogance of the youth. to say, oh, well, you know, these guys, they they kind of like Totsies, and they, they gave it the name Totsie Tal. So I, as I've said, we were really able to dispel that very, very easily by speaking to people from those days and who were part of that cultural setting of Joe Modise and who are highly respected, like Michael Dingaka, who unfortunately died earlier in the year, and others of the time who had joined MK and came from that background. A person like Paolo Jordan, no less, with his erudition and his love for so-called Tsotsital, loved to speak in the Angolan setting, in the residences that were shared with Joe Wadisi or the camps, him and others, when they got together with him and they relaxed and chatted away on a weekend, they loved to indulge in the Tsotsital. It was almost like the culture back home. There were people in the ANC and MK, younger people, who weren't attuned with that. And then they also... were influenced into thinking, oh God, isn't this guy something of a gangster? Not realizing that they were mouthing exactly what the anti-communist writers and the psyops, the psychological operations of the security police were projecting. So this book is an actual watershed in terms of speaking out for Joan Wood DC on all the five, six or so areas in which he singled out to cast him in a, in, in a negative light. Uh, I'll just quickly give you another example. The fact that they say he was too tough as a commander. You know, if you're running a military, whether it's the regular forces where it's easier to control people and organize discipline, or the irregular guerrilla forces where it's more difficult. You need strong leadership and you, you need strong discipline. Not talking about punishment, but a strong commander. And that's where the people we interact with also stand up for him. People who served under him, impeccable sources. And they're able to say, yes, he was this very... powerful leader. So in that sense, we're able to create an insight into the real person and show the human being, by the way, because when there wasn't a question of, of the parade ground or the operational work, etc., where you had to be absolutely disciplined uh, in order to succeed, in the relaxed periods, whether in exile or wherever, they found that this commander of theirs, who of course they all looked up to, respected, etc., could let his hair down and actually sit with the young new recruits even, never mind those who were somewhat older like Paolo Jordan and myself, and um, talk informally in a very engaging way, in an empathetic way. He was at heart, and the book shows it through his family and his daughters and other friends, an extremely kind and considerate human being. Tell us about your first encounter with Joe Mudise in 1962, soon after the launch of Umkondo Sizwe. MK is set up in 1961, after the Sharpville Massacre in March of that year. The ANC is banned, the Communist Party was banned, other organizations banned, such as the PAC. The reason why there was the turn to arms struggle is very important to grasp, because the regime in its repression had cut off all avenues of peaceful resistance, nonviolent resistance and opposition to the regime 
for change. The leadership of the ANC for years and the liberation movement had preferred a non-violent approach, but a militant activist approach. But to do anything post Sharpville and the bannings was criminalized. So it's in that kind of situation in the region with the Zimbabweans, the Namibians, the Angolans, the Mozambicans, all at the same time had adopted armed struggle to achieve a liberation of their countries and then the peace and security and development and equality that should go with it. So very high ideals and objectives. We began in 1961, December, with these operations. And it was the following year, early in 1962, that I met him for the first time. I was on the command of the then Natal Regional Command of MK, and I was reporting to JM, a young white boy of 23 years old. And I must say, with any of these top leaders, one would feel nervous. So it wasn't that he made me feel nervous, but in an additional way, as a commander, he wasn't laid back. It's not as though I was meeting a Walter Sisulu or a Joe Slovo. So he had to project his military position, the need for discipline, report in a very precise manner, uh, we had stolen dynamite and I was telling him about this and he wanted to know how much dynamite we had because we were needing to share this to be distributed around the country. And I was just rather vague. Uh, and he said, you know, you must understand with armed struggle, for instance, if we have a stock of arms, how many rifles or pistols? Because if we've got 20 rifles and 10 pistols, then we can arm 30 people. Now, how much dynamite sticks do we have in order to know how to share it out that all over the country we can carry out a higher level of sabotage operations, because up to then, we had used homemade chemicals and so on. So I felt in awe of him, and I must confess to being a little bit nervous. But that was soon overtaken by the fact when I knew him more closely, particularly into exile, where you're living with people all the time. So you're not on parade all the time. This is the time when you relax. And that's when I began to get to know him much more closely. And former President Tabombeki awarded Mudise the Order of the Star of South Africa. Some questioned why the award came about so late after Mudise's health had been declining for quite a while. So, Uncle Ronnie, what are your reflections on this? Well, yes, the award was uh, virtually at his deathbed. He had been unwell. They didn't realize the extent. It was cancer. And he was working, although even while he was the Minister of Defense, there were times when he went into hospital and had treatment. Uh, and I had to stand in for him, actually. But only the family, and I really would say his wife, Jackie, realized how serious it was. Maybe they also felt that with the treatment that he was receiving, he would overcome it. So he plunged into a final month or so of a very bad health. And, um, you know, those top awards really don't come early on. They do come at a later stage of tribute and sometimes posthumously. It's better when the person is still alive. And um, when I discovered through, I call her my sister, so Sis Jackie or Ma Jackie, Sidibi Mudisi, that look, it looks pretty bad and I was visiting him. So I, I remember going maybe it was even in cabinet that I mentioned that things were really looking bad. And um, at least a dozen of the members of cabinet led by Mudisi went to see him. And it was there that uh, almost unprepared, 
Tuttle and Becky realised the severity and that we wanted to bestow the then highest award. You know, it's been superseded at that stage. We didn't have those kind of orders, such as the Order of Oliver Tambo or of Chief Latuli and so on. So it came about that way. And at least he was able to still live and understand the extent of the tribute and the highest possible regard that Tabo and Becky and government had for him. And lastly, what are you hoping that readers will learn and take away after reading this book? Well, in the first place, to understand the outstanding role, sacrifice, in fact, that Joe Mudisi played all his adult life from really the age of 19, 20, as that young bus driver in Sophia Town when he joined the Youth League in the late 1940s, to understand who he was, to appreciate the incredible role that he performed, not for himself, but for the people of South Africa who he unreservedly was committed to in terms of their freedom, emancipation from racism and exploitation. That, secondly, so important, along with putting the record straight, that young people, the young generations growing up today from a very young age in school to those in their 20s and 30s, some who are born free should know and understand the role he played. But through him, it's not just a personality that we project. It's the fact that he was a product of the liberation struggle and of the ANC. To understand that he represented that whole generation of leaders from the top to the foot soldiers of the struggle, those in the armed struggle and those in the public arena, to understand our history, to grasp our history and the price paid by those who sacrificed. The, the, these two are really the key objectives. That was Ronnie Casserole speaking to Crima Media's Polity about Comrade and Commander, The Life and Times of Joe Mudisi.